thanks for uh, coming today. We obviously have a tremendous person here. Most of you know who she is, but it's an honor to be able to introduce her today, formally as well as informally. And it is a pleasure today to have John L. Hunt be our guest here at the summit. She's credited with helping her late husband, J.B. Hunt, to build one of the largest publicly traded companies, trucking companies in all of North America. She began working as a business team in Stuttgart in 1961 with the founding of J.B. Hunt Company. He was the entrepreneur and salesman. She was the organizer, manager, and businesswoman who made sure the debts were collected and the bills were paid. In 1969, the couple started J.B. Hunt Transport Services in Lowell, Arkansas, with five trucks and seven refrigerator trailers. Today, the company employs some 16,000 people. Since 2006, Mrs. Hunt has taken a very active role and projects developed and managed by her company, Hunt Ventures. Hunt Ventures now has over 1 million square feet of Class A office space and over 300,000 square feet of retail and dining. Additionally, over 1,000 hotel rooms, the John Q. Hammonds Convention Center, the State of the Art uh, Mercy Medical Center, Pinnacle Hills Memorial Gardens and Hunt Chapel and others. John L. Hunt has led or served on numerous state, university, and philanthropic organizations. She has received many honors for her work over the years. She is the mother of Brian and Jane, and she has seven grandchildren. Mrs. Hunt is one of the sweetest women you will ever meet, forgiving and loving, accepting, and has never forgotten her roots in Heber Springs, Arkansas. One of the most remarkable things about she and Mr. Hunt, regardless of their uh, progress in living out the American dream in and, and the fullest, uh, they never forgot where they came from. And they always have been able to relate to the common man, to the most wealthy. That takes a unique individual. And she has stayed highly engaged. Uh, for some reason, she's chosen not to retire. I'm going to ask that question today. Um, I decided, Mrs. Hunt, today, uh, since you're a friend and we love you dearly, um, that I would wear a tie today. And the reason I wore a tie it reminds me of one Sunday when we walked out of the, uh, we were, I was stood out and greeted people in our first little building over there with 13,000 square feet before we ever had this. And Mr. Hunt, he always wore a tie. And one day, he didn't wear a tie. And when he walked out, and we were talking, I said, where is your tie? I cannot believe you didn't wear a tie. I, have, I don't know if I've ever seen you in church without a tie. He said, well, I'm gonna tell you, and John L. ain't happy about it either. So, John L., in your honor today, it is a privilege to welcome you. Would y'all welcome one of the great ladies of Northwest Arkansas, John L. Hunt. There you go, girl. Have a seat, John L. Sounds like they like you. And to go on with the tie story, you know, um, back in our day of the beginning of the trucking in Oval, Johnny felt like that we should all dress like professional people, that we should dress like the bankers did and those people because the trucking in industry did not have a very good, uh, sometimes people didn't think too highly of them. And when he was a truck driver, he did wear a tie and he did wear like the caps like the bus drivers wore and he wore the wool 
Eisenhower type jacket and that was just the uniform that he wore when he was a truck driver. So he says we're all going to, we're going to dress up and we're going to look professional and make people think we've got a lot of money even if we don't. And so sometimes when somebody complained about a tie, he said, you know, I'd wear two ties if it'd get me another load of freight. <laughs> Mrs. Hunt, you just returned from Orlando, Florida, and you were there to be present for an honor that was given to your late husband, J.B. Hunt. I want to start today um, with all of us together uh, with you telling us what honor did you receive because the company of leaders that were honored is just really remarkable. So why don't you take a minute and tell us all that went on. Well, this was a great honor for, and I will say Johnny. When I say J.B. Hunt, I'm talking about the company. And when I say Johnny, that's the love of my heart, my husband, Johnny. And uh, we were so thrilled when we heard that Johnny was going to be inducted into the Council of Su Supply Chain Management Professionals in Orlando, Florida. It was their first year to have a Hall of Fame, and the people inducted into it, were Henry Ford, J.B. Hunt, and Malcolm McLean. And his, J.B. Hunt was for Intermodal. And um, I'm just going to tell you about Intermodal because in Arkansas, we don't get to see the trains go through with all the J.B. Hunt containers stacked on them. And uh, just the importance of what Intermodal really has done for our country and the shape that our country would be in today without Intermodal and to think that Johnny Hunt, a little boy that had to quit school in the seventh grade in the depression years and help make a living for a family, never did go back to school, but yet he was a man with vision and with dreams and you didn't tell him it couldn't be done because if you told him it couldn't be done, he would prove to you it could. And for him to join forces with the railroad and say, we can do this, we can make this happen, we can take the freight and put it on the trains, and it had never been done, and it was the friendship of two people that came about by Mike Haverty that was president of Santa Fe Railroad and came to see us about trying to do something, working together, because the railroads and the truckers were big competitors and did not communicate well with each other. But the friendship of those two led to a handshake on a train, and when um, they talked about it and how they could do it, and as Mike Haverty called me Monday as I arrived in Orlando for this award, and he said, um, Johnny said, they were sitting there, and Johnny got up and says, Mike, we've got a deal. And he said, well, what's the deal? And Johnny said, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. And did they ever figure it out? And just to tell you what, can, uh, what has happened with Intermodal and has changed our way of transportation, and I'm going to read this because it's too much statistics for me to remember. But um, today, each day, we have 5,500 containers on the rail. A full train load of J.B. Hunt Intermodal containers either goes in or out of Los Angeles every two hours per day, seven days a week. And we're not the only ones that do it now. We were, we were at the beginning, but other truckers do it too. So I'm just giving you J.B. Hunt statistics so you can see there would be a lot more if you added all the others. But if you were to, put, to back all the J.B. Hunt Intermodal containers end to end, it would fill the highway from Dallas to Chicago. And that's just the containers. It doesn't include the trucks. So you just think, now how would we get our cars from Dallas to Chicago if someone hadn't come up with intermodal? And uh, Johnny was, we, we say that he was before his time in going green. For the average 1,800 mile shipment we save, approximately 150 gallons of diesel fuel is saved. For, for all those that we ship, that every shipment of 1,800 miles. So I just wanted all of you to know that that little guy didn't do but too bad by joining forces and say, we can do this. And you can imagine when he walked in and said, we're going to start building all these containers and what in the world are you talking about? It's never been done, how are we going to do it? But we've had a lot of times in our life that he's told us those things and a lot of them worked, and I'll tell you one thing, if they didn't work, we never heard of it again. When something didn't work, it was in the past, and he never brought it up again. So when people think, well, everything he touched turned to gold, oh, no, no. I can tell you, I can tell you a lot of them, because I was right there. But 
he just, he let those go and he went on to the next one. Ms. Sonny, you are still going to work um, pretty consistently. Um, so something must excite you about getting up in the morning and, and going to work even though you're only 59 years of age. Um, but <laughs> let me ask you do, you, do you ever think that you'll retire? You know, I never planned to work. I, I had four years of home ec, and I, wanted, I loved cooking, sewing, keeping house, and being home with my children. And as long as he was a truck driver, I didn't have to work. And when we started our own business, it became necessary for me to go to work. I started out part-time, and don't ever do that. Don't ever start out part-time with your husband. Before you know it, you'll be there full-time, never get to leave. And that's what happened to me. And there were times later in life when I was still working, and I began to think, you know, I've worked a long, long time, and this was never my plan. And I mentioned, I'd mentioned once in a while about retiring, and Johnny'd say, what would you do? You would get bored. And I said, I've never had a bored day in my life. That's something was never has never been in my vocabulary, bored. And um, one day he said, you know, Johnny, you've always been there. You've always been there to do all the things I needed you to do and I don't want you to retire. And I said, don't worry, I never will. And I didn't think he ever would, so I thought, okay, they'll take me out of here one day because he's not going to, so I sure can. And then one day he just all of a sudden decides he'll retire. And when I went home that night, he said, well, I retired, but you didn't, so you're gonna have to keep going to work. And I said, you think you're, you're just be crazy if you think I'm gonna keep going to work when you're retiring and I'm the one that wanted to. I did work a little longer than he did and I retired. So I had some pretty nice years there. And, um, and I was not going to be involved in all this. He was starting at Pentacle Hills. I thought, I'm, I've done my duty and I'm not going to, he can do all this. And if you lose your money, I'll try to save a little over here and we can get by when you lose it on these new adventures you're going into. <laughs> so um, he started in with all this, but you know, working together all the years like we did, our talk at home was what he was doing because it had always been what we'd been doing with the company. So it wasn't like I didn't know what he was doing daily and I didn't know what was going on with the businesses and I didn't know what we had. But when, we fa when he fell and he lived for five days, and through those five days, I knew, we knew the direction we were going in. And so, um, actually, I'll just tell you this part. The morning, on Wednesday morning, and he passed away on Thursday, on Wednesday morning, I went in and I had a little talk with him. And he was in a coma all that time. But I thanked him for all of my years of working with him. Because I said, work with you all these years. And I know what you want, and I know how you do things, and you don't have to worry. I can take care of the family, and I can keep all of your projects going. And so as soon, right after, the next morning he passed away, and you know, I knew right after the funeral, I couldn't stay in bed and pull my head, put my head under the covers like I would have liked to have done, but I had a lot of people depending on me. He had, he had from rock quarries in Arkansas to Honduras to things across the country, so many projects here. There were a lot of pen, people depending on jobs. And I knew that I had to get up and I could keep things going because that was what he, he would smile and say, John L, you can do it, I know you can. So that's what I did. I got up and I put my feet to the floor and I continue to and I will gladly tell you I'll be 85 in January, and I am so thankful every morning that I can get up and I can keep going to work. And will I ever retire? Well, I don't know. We'll see where that path takes me. But for now, it energizes me. I don't know what would have happened to me without him because he was my life partner. And, and when they say half of you is gone, it is gone. But um, I'm, I get up in the mornings tired. I think I'm old enough I deserve to get up in the mornings tired. I used to get up and that was my best time. Now when I go home at night, I am tired. But you know, once I get there and I get involved in all that's going on and I get energized and I thrive on it, and it's the best thing that could be, the best place I could be right now is where I am trying to continue carrying on what he started. If not for him, for him, we wouldn't have any of this because I sure wouldn't have started anything. What a remarkable story. <laughs> Mr. Sant, even though I mentioned it a moment ago in introducing you, um, a lot of people here today may not know you like 
a few of us know you. They haven't been in Northwest Arkansas or maybe they've never had the privilege to see the inside look at your life and what you did at J.B. Hunt. But I want you to talk about, because you were right there with Mr. Hunt, helping in the vision. So I want you to tell people today, what did you do in the, in the formulation of the company, especially after you came up here and things really started popping and then it went public. Tell us what you, tell us what you did in the company. Well, I'll say a lot of it was just whatever needed to be done because in the beginning, you know, that's what it was. It was scrubbed the bathroom or after we came up here and we started in bringing in customers and it was washing the dishes after we served our customers lunch or whatever needed to be done. And that's what I've always felt like. If you could just tell these younger people as they start out, just go in there and do whatever needs to be done. I think that so many people think that they they're hired for a job and that's all they're supposed to do is that particular job and I've never felt that way. I felt like if they look around and see someone needs help do that. And so that was just the way that I worked. It was just whatever needed to be done. And in the beginning in Stuttgart when we started our company and I was working and, and um, Johnny would be up here because we had the distribution place here and so he would be here during the week and I would be there trying to work, run that operation, keep that plant going. And, night I would take the books home because back then you know we posted by hand everything you just had a big black journals and a pen and I would sit I would cook dinner fix my children get my children to bed and I would sit and I would post the books at home at night or I would take the I would pay the bills at home at night after I put them to bed I just did whatever needed to be done and then we came here and I uh, in the beginning after we from then and after we moved here I did the hiring, not a job I never did really care about. That was a big job, you know, trying to decide, do you hire this one or that one? And, and uh, I did that one. And, uh, but the one thing that I ended, and I paid, uh, I did just, like I said, a lot of jobs. The one thing that was always mine to do was the, the collections. And I will say, I am a really, really nice person. But when it comes to collecting money, I'm just about the meanest person you'll ever have to deal with on the phone. And I'm, I'm just one of those, you know, if you, if you haul the freight for them, then you should get paid for it. And I went through some very tough times in collecting. I mean tough times because it was before dereg deregulation and you haul for brokers, you haul for anybody you could get a load from. And... Um, I would tell them, you know, you had to move the trucks. And they'd say, what about this? And I'd say, you haul it and I'll collect it, you know. I didn't mind calling people at home at night at 10 o'clock, calling somebody at 5 o'clock in the morning, they hang up on you, you call them back, they hang up on you, call them back. And the third time you say, if you pay me, I won't call you again at 5 o'clock in the morning. But until then, I'll keep calling. <laughs> so I, that was my, my, really my main job that I did for so many years was collecting. And it was a full time, did other things. The, the job that was dearest to my heart of all, though, was the drivers. They, they had the word out on the road with the drivers, if you have a problem, call Miss Hunt. She'll take care of you. So it was not a, now it wasn't like you have brought drivers calling you all the time because they don't have that many problems. But if they had a really serious problem, I'd always rather they would call me than to leave a truck or to quit. I felt like my job was if I could save a driver a day I'd done, a good, I'd done a pretty good job. And so it was not unusual for me to get a call at two o'clock in the morning at home. Our number was very easy to remember, 4449999. And we wanted it published so that if they didn't eat us, they could call us. So it was also a published number. So I would get up at two o'clock in the morning and we didn't have the ways of communication like now. I would listen to their problem and I'd call the terminal they were out of where they thought they weren't getting a load or I would call a fleet manager or whoever I need to. 99 times out of 100, they were wrong. But you know, they just needed somebody to listen to their problem. And, and then I could work out their problem and I would have them call me, you know, during the day. They'd call and they could be so mad, so angry. Because you've got to think they're out in the bad weather, they're at a phone booth, they're out there alone all the time. They're alone. It's a lonely job on the road. They're away from family, they miss the children's birthday parties, they miss a lot of things at home. 
and it's a tough job. And I've had them call me, and I mean, I have been called every name, and I have been said everything to, and all I do is sit there, and I was over here signing driver's checks or doing something with the right hand while I was listening with the left. And uh, I would let them <coughs> talk, and I would even know just the right word to say to keep them talking, keep them talking, and let them say it all. And when I knew they had, I'd say, okay, now I've listened to you, now you'll listen to me. And you know, before they'd hang up, they would be apologizing to me. But I understood their problems. I was the wife of a truck driver. I lived the life at home of a truck driver's wife. So when the spouse called, I knew how to handle that part too when they couldn't get home for Christmas or when they could. We always got our home our drivers, still get our home, drivers home for Christmas, but maybe they couldn't get home for a birthday party. And I felt like I was the right one to talk to them because I knew what it was. Johnny was never home. He was never home for our anniversary till our 25th anniversary. And that's the truth. I don't care what day of the week it came on, he was never there. So we were gonna celebrate, go home from work and got home and our house was flooded because a pipe had broken. So that was the end of that celebration for the 25th anniversary. <laughs> that's funny. Now, Hunt Ventures, which is your company, is developing a lot of different projects in Northwest Arkansas. Can you tell us about some of what's going on and what's out there in the future? Well, we are excited about what's going on in, North, in Northwest Arkansas and Pinnacle Hills, this whole area. And um, I will tell you this, the main thing I hear all the time is a cheesecake factory. <laughs> well. <laughs> I happened to be in Dallas for a Saturday and went to a cheesecake factory. And I was in Orlando Monday for that award and um, that Johnny was given. And we went to a cheesecake factory on Tuesday. We all, all the developers work, all of us are like, we aren't the only ones. We have great developers in Northwest Arkansas. That's in Rogers and area, this whole area, Pinnacle Hills. That's why we're getting so many new things here is because of not just us, it's all the developers that are out here and we're all after the same ones, the same dollar, the same companies to put in. And you know, it doesn't matter which one of us gets it as long as we get them to come to Northwest Arkansas. That's what really counts. So we are always working on new projects and I have people ask me, well, why can't we get a Neiman Marcus and why can't we get that? I'll tell you, we do everything we could to try to get them here. And we work as hard as we can, just like all the developers do, because we all are working together to make this a better place to live. We live in the greatest place in the nation. Everyone here knows that. And it's not, I do want to tell you this because we talk about Johnny and he was ahead of his time so many times, but back in the 80s, he found out there was some grant money that we could get if we all joined together, Fayetteville, Springdale, Rogers, Bentonville, if we all joined together and made this one big metropolitan area. And he invited in all the, uh, the chamber managers and the mayors, Alice Walton came. They had lunches at our office and he would serve them lunch and he was trying to get us, let's all join together and make this one area. And you know, I kept telling him, I said, Johnny, they're not ready for this, not they're ready for this. He thought it could be done. He finally found out he couldn't accomplish that. But I know he is so proud today to know that we have accomplished that because we all are one night, great big area together. We are Northwest Arkansas. No question. Yeah. Anything out there in the future that you have in your mind that uh, you can talk about, about what you want to do in relationship to more stuff here, more stuff for the people of the region, anything? You know, Johnny always said that he looked out the windshield and I looked out the rear view mirror. He was always going forward with a new venture and I was just trying to hold it all together. And I just want to say that I have the greatest people working for me today, working with me. They have been with me all the way through. They hold me up, they support me, and they keep me going. And um, the one thing I do, I listen. Um, I tell them all the time, make me look good. Um, don't, I don't want pe uh, to be surrounded by people that say yes, tell me no when I'm wrong. And we all work together and I listen to everybody and I get everybody's input and then I decide 
what I should do. So really, they're the ones I look to for what the future is. Mm -hmm. They know how to go out here and get the business, and they go to the conventions, and they work, work it as hard as they can, mm -hmm. and then they tell me about it, and then we all sit together, and they, we make the decision of what we should do. And right now, we have a lot of things in the works, but we don't ever tell what we actually have, and none of the other developers really share theirs either until I sign that, that um, lease. Yeah, that's happened here before where various developers have talked about what they're going to do with you and you about <laughs> lost it all. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. I like well, it. Now Johnny, if Johnny was here, he'd probably tell you what great things are going to happen because <laughs> he was always telling about whatever was coming. <laughs> when we went public, we had that kind of spoiled things for him because he did. He loved to always tell, you, tell, you, tell all about the future and the things we were going to do that were way out there and everything. And you don't have to go public. You have to have to be a little more careful about what you say for, with the SEC and so forth. So it kind of dampened his spirits a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Hunt, you're involved in a lot of different philanthropic uh, projects and things. And right now there's a lot happening that you are involved in. What, what are you most passionate about? What's, what's really got you excited about in relationship to opportunities to be a part of uh, at this point in your life? Well, as you know, and Johnny and I have always made, our church comes first. Mm -hmm. With whatever we do, of our giving or whatever, it's always been our church comes first. So right now I'm real excited about our new, new campus we're going to have in Fayetteville. Badly needed, our church really needs it. So I'm very thankful that we're going to get to be a part of having new campus in Fayetteville. And then um, even though our cemetery has been here a while and um, if you don't know about our cemetery, I'll just put in a little ad sure. for that right now. Um, when Johnny passed away, we realized that there was a need for a cemetery in Northwest Arkansas. And we had no plans for that time because um, he, we were going to live forever, you know. After Red Hudson, which dear, dear, dear friend, Red was such a dear friend, and after Red passed away in August and then Johnny's was in December, and I said, Johnny, maybe we should go and uh, we should um, start making plans for something for later. And he'd say, yeah, we need to. Well, let's talk about it. Let's go see the rock quarry. That was just the way he was. He was always building for tomorrow and didn't want to think about the time, didn't think there was a need for a time like that. So when this happened to Johnny, we had no plans. We had no plans for a funeral home or any plans for anything that we were facing. And I want to sit here today and tell you from going, experiencing what we went through, and I'm sure so many of you here have experienced the same thing when things like that have, like that have happened to you. It's the toughest time to try to make decisions because you don't want to be in the, the funeral home, you don't want to be a cemetery, you don't want to be at any of those places. So all I can say is make plans in advance. But we did realize at that time that, there were no, that people were building new buildings here, building houses, but there had been no plans made for a new cemetery. So our ch my children and I decided at that time that we can do this. We can make that happen for Northwest Arkansas and we can build a new cemetery. So we've been very pleased and very happy about Pinnacle Memorial Gardens and the chapel we built there. It is beautiful, and it just is, to me, it's just that it's another place for Northwest Arkansas to have another beautiful thing, just like what Crystal Bridges has done for Northwest Arkansas is simply amazing, and we are so fortunate to live in a place that we have something like Crystal Bridges. And so that's what all of us are doing, and so that's very dear to my heart to keep that. And it is, you know, I think sometimes people have been misled a little bit about what that that cemetery is for it is a when we were we went out to California and to find uh, people to help us uh, with um, how to lay out ours and all and the one thing I said from the very beginning I want our cemetery to be a cemetery for all people a cemetery for all people and that is what it is and uh, then there are other things that um, the, oh, yesterday, you know, I was at another event for the Children's Arkansas Children's Hospital. Can you imagine that we're finally going to have Arkansas Children's Hospital here? Because who here hasn't been touched in some way? 
through family, friends, or some way. That's going to be such a big thing for this. And there are so many other things. I'm right now involved with Children's Advocacy for an event that I'm being honored there in October, and I'm so appreciative of that. But to think of our little children that are suffering, that are being abused and are suffering, and how much we need to give money to children's advocacy to carry on so that they can get the, the help they need. How many times do you pick up a newspaper and you don't read about a child? And there are so many like that. Just recently, um, my daughter just happened to be walking through the room and the TV was on and she heard about the uh, women's shelter in Bentonville going to shut down. And if she hadn't just walked through the room at that time, and she was able to step up and give and keep that, that women's shelter going. We have so many things in our area that we need to give to. And the one thing about Northwest Arkansas that I am so thankful for is that we do have people in Northwest Arkansas that are so giving. We're in a fortunate, very fortunate area, very unusual area because people here do give, and that's why we have so much. We're so blessed to have all that we have here. No question. Now, Ms. Hunt, obviously, as I said a moment ago, a lot of the folks don't, don't know you like uh, some of us know you, and many never had the privilege to meet Mr. Hunt personally. Um, but there's also a lot of younger adults here today that are starting their careers, um, there are people that are restarting their careers. And, and Mr. Hunt, he would want to make sure that they did certain things. I mean, he would, if they walked up to him and, and had coffee with him and said, so Mr. Hunt, what should I do with my career? How should I do this? What should I do? I want you to act like he is here talking to those folks today. And uh, why don't you talk to him about what he would tell them about their future in business? Every morning, he started his morning by getting up early and going into a room and reading his Bible and having his prayer time for an hour or two hours, whatever it took. The Bible was his roadmap, and that's the way he started his day off. And then he would come out and he'd say, it's going to be a great day. And that was his slogan every day. Today was a, it's going to be a great day. Yesterday was great, today is going to be great, and tomorrow will even be better. He was the most optimistic person you will ever see. And one thing that he did um, when he started drawing his Social Security, you know, like I said, he started, he started school when he was 10 years, when he was four years old. He's, he had two older brothers, and they, he cried to go to school, and they were in a one-room school. The teacher said, just let him come on to school. So you can imagine he went to a one-room school to the seventh grade. So he was only 10 years old, really, when he quit school. But he always knew that he wanted to make things better. He wanted, he could do, he, he just had that belief in always being able to do things. So he was a very encouraging, but he looked forward to drawing his Social Security. It was a big deal for him. And so, sure enough, when he got his social security, he, he had it come, you know, the, they sent it, forwarded it, to, put it in his account, and then he would have Catherine, uh, that has always worked with us, and uh, she would get the cash and put it in the bank envelope and give him the cash. He put that envelope in one pocket, and he put his money in another. And during that month, he would give away that money and he would find maybe it would be a young lady at a service station filling up her car. And he said, John L., I, could th I knew what she was paying for gas, and I knew what she was probably making an hour, and that she had little children to feed when she went home. And he'd pay for the gas. But he could find people. He didn't just give the money to just the children and grandchildren, that sort of thing. He could find people that none of us might not see, but he could just see those people. And by the end of the month, he had given away all that money. And then the next month, he started on another. Now, when he passed away, I found some money in his little Social Security envelope. But I'll tell you, he got so much joy in being able to give to people in need, and he did spot those people. But he was always encouraging everyone. He would pass out his cars to some little boy in school and say, when you get out of school, 
you come see me and I'll give you a job driving a truck or something like that, encourage him. One thing he would say that I've heard him say is, and I've heard that he did say, is don't let anyone build a fence around your dreams. He felt like if anything was possible, and I'll tell you this, if he could do it, these young people out there today can do it too. And yes, he did believe in people having a college education. He felt like he missed out on something because of the, the um, friendships you made, the things that went along with college. But then you might also hear him say, well, if he'd quit school a little earlier, he'd been a lot farther down the road. Mr. Hunt used to say, hey, at my age, I'm too old to have a bad day. That's exactly right. And, uh, he never had a bad day. He was always very good about that, no question about it. Ms. Hunt, when you reflect on your life, and at this point in life, um, you know, you have a lot of life to reflect upon, and I'm sure you do. Uh, when you look back, what brings you the most fulfillment? Of course, my family always. Any time with my family, my children, my grandchildren, that's my special time. And we have had a real full life. We've had, when I look back on it and the opportunities we've had, the things that we've done, and I'll tell you, we had some, we had some tough times. We had some tough times. We had a business up here. It burned. Three weeks later, everything we had in Stuttgart, 10 years after we started our plan in Stuttgart, we watched it burn to the ground. And those are tough times. You think it can't happen? It did to us. I didn't think it could. Three weeks apart, it did. You know, you don't have enough insurance to cover it all. And we sat there and uh, we went home after losing it all. And we went home and I was sitting in a rocking chair as rocking as I did in bad times. And, you know, we're just going to have to go to Little Rock, back to Little Rock, and you're going to have to start driving a truck. And we sat there a little while and Joe says, come on, get up. Let's go out here and we can get this and we can start it over and we started over. We had times like that come along. So we've been fortunate to go through tough times because that makes you stronger and makes you know that, hey, even though I'm down right now and things aren't good, I can get up and I can go again and I can make it. We can make it and we're going to. One thing we always knew that no matter what happened, if you're happy in the place you are now, and we were happy and we were two little rooms in Stuttgart, I mean, in Texarkana, when we first married, we had a bedroom and a little kitchen, just a little bedroom, too, kitchen and bathroom. You know, I couldn't have been happier. Of course, when you're first married, you're happy anywhere. And we, we then got to move after we moved away from there to a three-bedroom. But I've always felt like if you're happy where you are at those times, and we would often say, you know, if you have to go back, we'd be happy again there, too. And uh, you don't always have to be on top of the world to be happy. So I'm fortunate to have gone through a lot of experience in my life and that I can look back and just say, thankful for all the things, all the blessings we've had. And Johnny and I would be driving along and we'd reach over and take each other's hands and say, why us? Why did this happen to us? I had no education for all I did, none at all. Just worked by the seat of my plants and did what had to be done. But we would say, why us? We felt like God really blessed us, and that's why we try to give back now as we can. And I just hope that I will really be remembered that I did really care about people. I really cared about every one of you that I see, the hugs I get, and the times I get to be with people. And that's why I try to go to all the things I do, because that energizes me and gives me that good, warm feeling that somebody cares about me, just like I care about them. And the bad things that we've gone through in the past and some things that didn't turn out and some things that you were disappointed in the way they went, let the bad things in your life go. If you hold on to them, they'll pull you down. And any time you start thinking about those bad things of your life, that will just take you down. And the minute you turn off that remote control and say, I'm not going to let my thoughts go there, and you start thinking about good things for the future, you will have a good day. And I just, um, I've been touched by a lot of lives, and I just hope that somewhere along the road that one of those drivers that's driving that J.B. Hunt truck out there knows that I really love him. Well, mm. <laughs> well, uh, gang, let me just say it this way. Enough said. What a great close. We love you. We thank God for you.
and uh, appreciate your heart so much. And you do love people, and everybody knows that you do. So anyway, all of you in Northwest Arkansas, this is a privilege. And uh, we honor you and we bless you here today, John L. Hunt. Would y'all please give one more expression of love and grace to Mrs. Hunt today. I appreciate all of you being here more than you know. Thank you.